All right. So we are recording. Let's jump over to the home page here, starting page. My name is Peter Smallage. I'm the New York State Extension Forester, and uh, I have a, a background working in uh, forest management, forest ecology, and so and did some graduate work on diseases of trees. I worked particularly on a disease of light ash. So this interface of forest management and forest um, uh, pests uh, and, the, and how that interfaces in an ecological context has always been of interest to me. And then you have something like American beech that's one of the more common species in the Northeast and seeing how it is responding to some um, the, the current pressures it has in terms of an insect and a disease and that interfaces with deer and influences how we are able to regenerate the forest, which is a big deal, then uh, it's kind of like a kind of a perfect um, interface um, of a topic that's something that I'm very interested in. So you have my contact information there and I'll show that again on the very last slide. And before we get going, if you, and I've got a bit of a cough. <laughs> Sorry about that. So I'll try not to cough into the microphone. Um, it's not contagious from here, but it probably doesn't sound very good. Um, before we get going, what I'd like you to do, if you're interested, is you go to the upper left-hand corner of your screen, you'll see the File menu, then you go and select either Save or Save As, and then choose the Document. Go ahead and do this as I'm speaking. Save document, and then that will, and then you have the option to save it as a UCF file type or a PDF file type. Go with the PDF file type, and then what you're doing when you save the document is you're saving this presentation as a PDF. So if there are websites that I show in here, and I'm going to show a few websites, or um, I'm not going to really show a lot of data slides, maybe a couple. But if you want to refer back to anything, then you'll have you'll have that available. This is being recorded, and it will also be posted then to the Forest Connect YouTube channel, which you can see listed on the screen. The, the middle website that you see, which is cornellforestconnect.ning.com, is a social media site, and uh, we developed that so that there's a place for people to come together to talk and to share ideas and to share uh, questions and answers. Um, there's over 400 people that belong to that. Uh, so if you're familiar with Facebook, Facebook is an example of a social media site. This is a social media site, but it is, I promise you, is not Facebook and doesn't have some of the drawbacks that Facebook has. Anybody can go to the Ning site and read the content. If you want to post content, which would include posting pictures or posting questions or posting answers, or if you have an educational event and you want to post an educational event, you can do that at the Ning site as well. If you're a member, membership is free. You just have to sign up. So hopefully you'll do that. Hopefully you'll go there and if people ask questions and you know the answer, respond to that. Right. So the beauty of a social network is that we can draw information from many people, the experiences and the wisdom that, that are shared are not shared, but that could be shared um, around the people that are participating. So without any more, let's jump right into this. So we're going to be talking about the ecology and management of American beech in our northeastern woodlots and sugar bushes. As I said, there's a great deal of work that's been done on this. I list here people who have um, been involved in funding agencies who have been involved. In particular, let me call your attention to Dave Jackson. Dave Jackson is an extension, regional extension forestry specialist with Penn State and has done a, a lot of work with herbicides and herbicide management of American beech as well as other species. Dave is giving a general forest herbicide webinar and then an update on herbicide research on May 20th of this year. So mark that on your calendar. If you're participating here, if you got the emails, then you will you should automatically get emails for that as well. But just to let you know, this is uh, what I'm presenting here is um, a little bit of my work, but a lot of work by a lot of people, and for them, I am appreciative. This is also falls within the context of a initiative known as the Restore New York Woodlands Initiative. It's it's a topic that's central to that, and the Restore New York 
Newark Woodlands Initiative recognizes that New York's forests, as well as many of the northeastern forests, are maturing, that they're um, in the latter half or beyond of their kind of natural life cycle, and that if we're not paying attention to how those forests are going to regenerate, if they can regenerate, then we'll have different forests in the future than we have today. And that's, um, you know, if we have those different forests, they may provide a different set of services that we depend upon. And there are three common elements that limit uh, the ability of forests to regenerate. You see them listed here, and you can see that we're primarily looking at the green text here as controlling interfering vegetation. So we've had other other uh, webinars on these other topics, um, and we'll have more in the future. So let's start with a little bit of uh, beach ecology and background. Um, American beech is common in many woodlands, and you know sometimes I forget just how common it is when we think about northeastern hardwoods or the hardwood forest, northern hardwoods, it's a beech, birch, maple forest. So beech is a very common element in our northern forests. It's uh, common from the maritime provinces in Canada, south um, in the United States, uh, well down into the um, mid-Atlantic and beyond states, and then as you get into the western lake states, uh, it starts to become less important, um, but still has a presence. So it's very common, and and that's in part, you know, as we see, you know, the, the proliferation of beach is a problem because it's relatively common. So it's a, it's magnifying itself. It's one of the most, if not the most, shade tolerant of the hardwoods. That means it can survive in the understory. If there's a closed canopy above it, the seedlings can survive without dying. Many uh, other species don't share that quality. They're mid-tolerant or intolerant of shade. Its ability to, well, let me jump ahead one bullet, it has low browse value. So deer typically do not eat the beech trees. If, if deer are eating beech, that means there's probably not much, if anything, otherwise to eat. Um, and because of that, the seedlings and the, and the sprouts are left intact. And then if there's a canopy gap, it's shade tolerant, so there's it's present in the understory and it's able to take advantage of that opening. So that's why if you go out and you're cutting firewood or there's a selection system of harvesting single tree selection, you're moving individual trees and there's beach in the understory, that small disturbance, that limited scale disturbance is going to favor species like American beach. And its reproduction is both sexual and asexual. So it can reproduce by seeds. Uh, Ralph Nyland did some work uh, and looked at seed origin beach um, in the Adirondacks and found there's some amount of variability, but uh, and I'd have to go back and reread re that paper, but my memory is that it's more often than not the major overwhelming majority of stems, like 60 to 75 percent of the stems are of sprout origin. When I say sprouts, I'm usually talking about root sprouts. And this is a phenomenon of beech where it, the, the tree, the parent tree, has a root system, as all trees do, and on the beech tree, that root system will send um, suckers or sprouts up from the roots. So they're genetically identical to the parent. They're connected to an existing root system so they can take advantage of the of the gathering capacity of that root system. And they're you know, also going to be shade tolerant and also going to be of low browse value. So each has the ability to reproduce by seed, which you can see in the lower left-hand corner. That's the, uh, the, spine, the spiny husk or it can reproduce by uh, stump suckers. If the tree is cut, the stump will sprout and the roots will sprout. The roots will sprout no matter what, but they'll especially sprout if the parent tree is injured or is killed, either by cutting or by disease. So is beech bad? In, uh, I've given this talk and variants of this talk and done workshops and woods walks and talked a lot about how to kill beech and so people I think unfairly attribute to me this disdain for American beach, and I want to go on record here saying it's not the case, that I think beach is actually a fabulous tree um, for a lot of different reasons, and the people that like beach like it for different reasons. It could be that you're interested in the fruit, which is valuable for wildlife, and the, the, the fruit has about a seven-year 
periodicity for bumper crops, mast crops. So every seven years you get a bumper crop of the beech nuts. A few in the off years, but it's uh, particularly relevant in, uh, on seven-year cycles. And that explains why uh, if all we had was beech, it wouldn't necessarily be a good thing for wildlife because as, as the tree cycles in its fruit production, there are going to be many years where there's not much fruit production. So if all you have is beech, every seventh or so year, sixth or seventh year, even let's say every fifth year, you have a bumper crop of beech nuts, but the the um, the years in between, you have uh, not much produced. So that's why diversity in the forest is important. Beech has uh, is a very nice firewood, has a good BTU value. It's quite a hardwood, and um, it's been used in a variety of different products. And just aesthetically, it's an attractive tree. It's a stately, attractive tree. I grew up in uh, northern Indiana and remember some forests that had large, healthy beech trees. And they're just they're really beautiful trees to look at. Excuse me. So we're going to be talking about when beach is a problem, and I'd like to point out that there are uh, occasions when beach is not a problem. In fact, one of the forest owners that I know was commenting you know, that he didn't understand why there's such concern about why we needed to, to go out and try and kill all the beach, and that's not the objective. But to the point here, when it, there, there are situation, situations when beach is not a problem, and these relate in part to ownership objectives. And so if, if an owner is conscious and aware of the potential for beach in the woods, and if it's not interfering with their objectives, then by definition, it's not a problem. Um, now, it may become a problem through time, or the owner's awareness or the owner's objectives may change, and they may see that they need to do something with beach. But you know, as a, as a default position, I don't want to suggest that beach, uh, in all circumstances, is bad. It may be that you have a few scattered trees in the woods that my wife and I own. We have uh, a couple of trees in one corner on the northern edge, and a couple of trees in another spot on the southern edge. And by and large, beach is not uh, beach is barely present on our property. And because of that, it, I don't. It's not. I don't consider it as a problem tree there. Or we're going to be talking about the disease, and you see a picture here of this tree with the pink ribbon on it. This is a tree that's on the uh, edge of, a, of what's going to be a harvested uh, stand on the Cornell's Arnott Forest. It's probably 18 inches in diameter and has absolutely no evidence of the disease, so either the insect precursor to the fungus, and it's a beautiful tree. And so we've marked it and informed the loggers of the need to pay particular attention to this. Now, the nice thing, if this tree was, let's say, was cut in the process of harvesting, it would sprout. You know, the stumps would sprout, the roots would sprout, and so we would get genetically the same tree coming back as long as we didn't uh, do something that killed the root system. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So um, I, I've alluded to this disease, and the disease is known as beech bark disease or beech bark decline, and it's a combination of an insect and a fungus. And these were thought to, both of these were thought to have been introduced into Nova Scotia in the late 1890s, and I was just reviewing some old historical pathology literature, and it looks like it was um, found in the United States in the 19. 20s and spread from the northeast in Maine to the southwest across the New England states and the northern mid-Atlantic and, and Atlantic states. And as I was saying in the 80s when I was in forestry school in Indiana, there was no evidence of this disease. So, and it may, I don't know if it's there now, but it's, so it has been spreading south and west and, and as early as, as 10 years ago was um, either limited or not present in uh, West Virginia, for example. There is no cure, um, so there's there's not any way you're not going to, at least in a practical sense, go out and give an injection or spray something that's going to, uh, to limit the impacts of this um, decline disease. So it's, and it's probably not even technically a decline disease, it's a, a decline. So, so that the insect you see in the top picture uh, is a scale insect, and the scale insect has a piercing sucking mouth part, which is you know, similar to a mosquito has a piercing sucking mouth part, an aphid does, and so the 
the insect probes the tree um, and it kills a portion of that tree and where that tree then dies or becomes numbed by the presence of the insect, the fungus is able to become established. So the little white flecks that you see are not the insect, it's a waxy exudate or it's called a wool that uh, it's exuded by the insect probably to help manage their microclimate and it's the effects of that insect that allow for the fungus which is um, I've, I've most recently seen it called nectria I've also seen it referred to as cryphonectria uh, become established and you'll develop these pock marks or these zones of decay that are also then subsequently colonized by other fungi and uh, and these and these zones of decay uh, will coalesce and uh, will coalesce and, and eventually spread along the length of the tree. So Tom Ward's describing uh, beech bark disease spreading westward across the Upper Peninsula and southward along the western shore of Lake Michigan. So it's 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 into the Upper Lake states. Good, thank you. Um, interestingly, if you will, there's no uh, it, what the reading that I've done suggests that, that both of these are introduced species. It seems that they came in at the same time. They are otherwise independent. The, the insect, for example, is not a vector of the fungus. And that's I guess neither here nor there. I guess what it means is that you can't, you know, by controlling the in insect, you're not going to control the fungus and vice versa. There is thought to be some resistance or tolerance in American beech trees and something on the order they're estimated that one percent of the clones, so the genetic units, one percent of those are uh, resistant. So let's just take a look at you know kind of a progression of beech bark disease as it occurs in trees. So the first thing you do is you would, you would have an otherwise clean beech tree and you would see these scale insects we wouldn't see the insects, but you'd see the, the exudates appearing on the tree. Here it is again. Um, you can see the you know the patches of the insect. At this point, there's no evidence of the fungus, at least as we can see. But then you'll you'll develop the the fungus will begin to develop, and you'll see these are the parathecial fruiting bodies of the fungus, and there are two two species of nectria, and I don't remember the second one. This is um, nectria coccinea variety faginata, which is thought to be weakly parasitic, and then there's another one that tends to be uh, more strongly parasitic. Uh, I'm not sure which is pictured here, but the point is that there's at least a couple of fungi, and they form these, um, these pockmark areas. These are the fruiting bodies. And then what the fruiting bodies, or what this area then develops into, are these kind of dead necrotic pockmarks on the tree. And so this, the whole side of this tree now has become infected, and, and it's the, the tissue of the wood beneath the bark is dead. It allows for other fungi to colonize and to start to kill the tree. And then eventually the tree looks really ugly. Um, trees that are... You know, looking like this, I would put on the three to five year window before they die, and trees like this are on the one to three window before they die. Uh, sometimes they just die outright standing up. Other times they will, because of the weakness of the wood associated with the decay fungi, the trees will snap. And when you have trees like this, you have them clustered. That triggers a root suckering response, as you see in the background. So you see all of the stems in the background. Every one of those sapling, large seedling or small sapling whips that you see is an American beech. It's genetically identical to the trees that are dying from the beech bark disease, which means that those uh, vegetative sprouts will also be susceptible to the disease. So beech bark disease um, creates a problem. Um, the problem is not really just beech bark disease, but it's also deer. Let me uh, explain this picture before I go on. So I, um, this was a, an area out at the Arnott Forest. I was walking with our daughters, and I looked down the hill, and I saw this uh, diseased tree here, and then a diseased tree in the background, and I saw these two trees, and I thought, aha, this is a great picture to illustrate the um, ability of 
um, you know, the ability of some of these American beech trees to be resistant. So I had my daughters go stand there, and I took their pictures, and I walked down and looked at them. And those two trees that appear clean on this side of the tree look like this on the on the opposite side of the tree. So they were, in fact, infected, but the, the, the infection was isolated just to a, um, a vertical column of that stem. Uh, Carl has shared a link to a, a, a publication looking at the modeling the consequences of beech bark disease. Um, that's by a different author than what I was seeing. So the Canadian Journal of Forest Research also has an article that talks about modeling the effects of beech bark disease. So the, the end result, though, is that the, the consequences of beech bark disease and overabundance by deer where, that's, where that occurs uh, results in a forest that becomes increasingly unstable and unhealthy and unproductive. So you, you kill the larger organisms, the larger stems, they sprout, they, those sprouts are also susceptible. The presence of deer reduces the abundance of other species, most of which tend to be intolerant or less tolerant of shade than the American beech. And so where you have beech present, you have its abundance um, and its dominance increasing. And so if there's an opportunity to deal with these forests, um, it's better to deal with them where beech bark disease is prevalent. It's, it's your options, as you'll see in just a moment, are um, are improved if you deal with them when you still have larger sized trees which have some marketable value. And we'll talk about that in just a second. So the problem then with beech is that we have disturbance. Um, disturbance promotes root suckering. A lot of different activities will promote root suckering. Those suckers have very good survival and the suckers will uh, regenerate will inhibit the regeneration of other hardwood species. You can see here's a, a, a beech tree. That's a, this is at the Pinchot Estate down in Milford, Pennsylvania. It's a U.S. Forest Service uh, station and National Historic Landmark. And this was a beech bark disease. This was a road crew off to the right had just gouged out a little bit of the of the road ditch damage some of the root system of this beech tree, and then you can see the, the beech thicket that is developing in response to that damage. So these, these suckers, because they create a very dense layer, a lot of foliage shades the understory, and that inhibits the ability of other species to regenerate. And you throw on top of that deer, uh, deer create a legacy effect, if you will, so that they remove the um, species that would have a chance to survive, and over years and years of too many deer, um, you're, you're creating a situation that's very hard to reserve itself from. Carl says, if we keep the deer in check, the beech trees have a better chance of survival. Um, no, Well, so the beech bark disease is going to kill the trees. We'll kill the beech trees. By controlling the deer, we control, we limit um, the pressure on other species that may be desirable, and then we are able to um, encourage their survival. So what we're trying to do is keep balance in the forest. Uh, the presence of deer and the presence of beech bark disease is, up, is upsetting that balance, shifting it in favor of beech. So why do we want to control beech? I go back to an earlier slide. You may not need to. You need to consider all the angles and, and the particular ownership objectives. But typically, you would want to control it if you're trying to regenerate other hardwood species. If you have access issues, and maple producers are a good example of that, if they're trying to install maple tubing or using buckets to collect sap, beech thickets, as you see pictured here, are an unpleasant place to be carrying a bucket full of sap or to drag tubing. And these also present, present uh, potential hazard trees, uh, trees that have died because of the disease. The steps that you should take, so this is kind of a summary statement, but I'll, I'll throw it out here just so you can have, have it in your mind as we talk through the management aspects. Within each management unit or stand, you'd want to identify what your objectives are for that stand, and then relative to those objectives, you would have management um, treatment objectives that would include the extent of the control. So do you want to control it 
on 100% of the area or just in corridors, perhaps where you have maple tubing. The intensity, so do you want to, within the area that you control, are you wanting to control 50% of the stems or 90% of the stems? And then how long do you want to have that control? So if you just need a short-term control, there's a greater variety of options at your disposal. A longer-term control, there are fewer options available. Once you have that information, you've essentially identified your target, and you can evaluate all the reasonable treatments. Um, and some of them will you, that evaluation process may go fairly quickly, but it's important, I think, to consider uh, all of those options rather than just saying the last time we treated beech, here's what we did, and so we'll do that again. It's important to think about how other vegetation is going to respond because if you're controlling. If you have beach in the understory and you're controlling that, you're going to be opening up a great deal of sunlight and creating favorable conditions for the growth of something. And so you want to make sure that um, that you're uh, able to manage and uh, are, are uh, favoring desirable species. You would apply your treatments. Uh, we'll talk about those treatments here in just a minute and then uh, monitor the effectiveness of the strategy and, and also plan for, for other species that may show up either desirable or undesirable species. John's pointing out that beech is of low commercial value, which it is compared to other desirable species. Um, so we're talking about treatments. I want to give you a framework for thinking about these treatments. There's, there's two, excuse me a second. <laughs> There are two components to a treatment. There's the method, which is the way the treatment is delivered, and that's either mechanical or chemical. And then there's the mode, and that's the level of specificity to the target. So uh, a high level of specificity to a target is selective, and a low level of specificity to target is broadcast. So you can see these are just examples. So an example of a selective mechanical a chainsaw where you go out and cut down an individual tree is selective mechanical. And a broadcast mechanical is your lawnmower because your lawnmower is not specific to a target. Everything inside the wheels of your lawnmower or your brush hog is going to be cut. So it will be I'll be when I when I review the variety of different treatment op options, I'll couch them in terms of a selective chemical or a broadcast mechanical and so forth. And those treatments are going to be utilized within a, a framework that's known as integrated vegetation management. And integrated vegetation management is, is parallel, if you will, to integrated pest management. Some of you may be familiar with that. And it's Fundamentally, what it's doing is trying to find an effective way and an appropriate way to control undesirable plants and enhance the populations of desirable plants. So it's what it is not is just a process of saying, okay, I have a, uh, a backpack sprayer and, and I have beach, and so therefore I'm going to go spray a bunch of plants. You know, that's, that's not the integrated uh, vegetation management strategy. I don't want to go into too much detail with this because um, I've got a lot more to cover, and I'm halfway through the webinar, so I'll call your attention to the Ning site, the Cornell Forest Connect .ning .com site. I've posted an article there on integrated vegetation management, so I'd encourage you to go there and read that. Uh, and that's if you go to the Ning site, it's one of you'll see recent activity, and you'll see something about the beach webinar, and just click on that and. And you'll see the IVM article. You'll also see a link to the to the website that Dave Jackson manages, which is a really good website on forest vegetation management. I've posted it there. I'd encourage you to go look at that. Dave has a lot of it. If you're if you're planning to use herbicides in particular, Dave provides a lot of very good information on safe and effective methods and, and describing the different herbicides that are available. So we have costs, and just very quickly, there's the actual costs. There are the environmental costs, which can be on both the positive and the negative side. Uh, so there's, you know, if you use the wrong treatment, you may have unnecessary and undue ecological costs. If you try to, um, you know, if you try to to go, you know, if you're if you're not effective, and the plant spreads more. 
then you had a negative. It also had a negative ecological cost. And then finally, there are costs associated with the people, and it's, 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 it's important and essential that we think about who's doing the work and what are they being exposed to, and if it's on a steep slope, what kinds of equipment should they or shouldn't they be using? Um, this is just you know thinking about humanity, which is an appropriate thing to do. Beach has three weak links, the root system, the thinness of the bark, and the foliage, and we'll look at each of these when we think about the different treatment strategies. And we're going to break out those treatment strategies uh, based upon the predominant size of the beach. So we're going to look at three different categories where we have trees that are, I'll say, firewood size and larger. So these are trees that have some uh, utilitarian value, trees that are not quite firewood. So these would be sapling sized trees and then seedlings or beach whips. And there will be um, some information uh, relative to the mechanical and the chemical treatments. And I'm not trying to push one or the other, mechanical or chemical. Um, it's not my role is to tell you what you should do, but rather to help inform you about the trade-offs of each of these and the, the uh, effectiveness of each of these, and then you can decide whether you want to go with a mechanical or a chemical treatment. Speaking of chemicals, though, it's important that uh, we I provide this uh, little bit of a pesticide disclaimer. Uh, recognize that pesticide is the broad category, so it's a, a side, meaning a killer of pests, so anything that's considered a pest, and we have rodenticides, we have fungicides, we have insecticides, and we have pesticides, we have herbicides, rather. So herbicides are that category of pesticides that treat plants. So all everything that we'll be talking about is just talking about herbicides. All herbicides, and thus all pesticides, or I should say that the other way, all pesticides and thus all herbicides have a label, and that label is the law. That label is a, when you buy that pesticide at Home Depot or the tractor store or Arbor Kim or wherever you go, that label is the law in, a, in the EPA, which delegates authority in New York to the Bureau of Pesticide Management, presumes that you are reading and following that label. You don't have to sign it, but you effectively are agreeing to a contract. So be familiar with that label. Um, secondly, in most, uh, and I see this a lot. Uh, I don't see it as much maybe as I used to, and it's maybe because I talk about it more, um, and so people don't, I don't hear it as much. But I've often heard about these home remedies, and, and you've heard of them too. Um, I hope none of you use them, but they often go something like, you know, you take yesterday's coffee and you cut the ears off of your neighbor's cat and you stir it together with vinegar and some diesel fuel and a little bit of paint thinner and you, you know, you let it simmer for two weeks during a full moon in your upstairs closet and then you have something and you go out and you spray it on beach and oh yeah my neighbor's cousin Vinny said that it kind of works and you know when you probe into the question you know why are people doing this they say well I don't want to use a chemical well they're using a chemical the difference is they don't know what they're using and the, the pesticides the herbicides that are used you may or may not like what they do and they may have some um, they all, all of them are different, and some of them are more, I'll say, environmentally friendly than others. And you may or may not feel comfortable with the risks, but at least the risks are fairly well known. And so what we don't know with home remedies is anything about them or what they're going to do. And in most cases, they are not effective, so stay away from them. Um, and uh, John is saying that Basically, any disturbance stimulates root suckering, which has been what I've pretty much seen as well. Thank you, John. Okay, so let's look at the woodlots that are dominated by firewood size and larger trees. These probably have had little or no recent cutting. Um, the beech bark disease that was there has either gone through, the killing front has gone through, and the aftermath forest has matured, or the killing front hasn't arrived. And there may or may not be many root suckers present. Uh, on the mechanical side, with these just these larger trees, there are options for controlling. When I say control, what I mean is that you're limiting the abundance. You're having an effect on the balance of each relative to other species. 
um, the option of mechanical to control beach in these woods is, uh, essentially doesn't exist. Uh, early efforts in the 70s and the 80s used different cutting regimes, cutting intensities, season of cutting, and there was no particularly reliable way to control the abundance and the balance of beech relative to other species. What they typically found is when you cut beech, you get a lot of beech back. Um, and some people say, well, if you cut it in the, during the drought in August, then there's less of it. But then the research that I've seen says if you go back 10 years later, you basically have a beech forest. So um, I, I'm, I don't want to, I mean, we have to be careful with how we use science. Science is, you know, the process of, you know, failing to reject or failing to accept a hypothesis so we never actually prove something, we just are not able to disprove something. So there may be some ways to do it, but I can say that there have been a lot of different ways tried, none of which so far have proven um, effective. At least, well, I can't, I can't name any. If somebody tells you one, then I would, you know, you're welcome to go ahead and try it, but proceed with caution. You know, try it on a couple acres, don't try it on um, 200 acres. All right, so Dan brings up the high stump method promoted by Ralph. I haven't heard that, so I'll have to, Dan, if you know more about that, type it in here, or actually what I'd say, if, if there are options, maybe we can develop a conversation on the uh, Ning site, and then um, you know, somebody that's familiar with that high stump. And I'll, I can give Ralph a call and see what he knows about that. So. Okay, so moving along here, uh, to control beach in these woods, you're going to probably have to use selective chemical treatments. And I say selective because broadcast, if you're dealing with big trees, a broadcast treatment would basically mean an aerial application of an herbicide and uh, to a mature forest, and I'm not prepared to um, recommend that. In fact, I think there's a lot of reasons why that wouldn't be a good idea. So a selective chemical treatments are either going to be a cut stump, and I'll show pictures of that, or hack and squirt, and we'll look at each of these in, um, in detail. So Tom also would like some more information on high stump. So if Dan can't provide it or doesn't get a chance to type it in, I'll give Ralph a call and I'll go to the Ning site and I'll, and I'll offer some commentary, some insights from Ralph on that. So let's look at these two methods. Oops. Before we do that, I should watch my notes. Before we do that, we're going to look at the, the two common herbicides um, that I've been familiar with. And, and I use these because they're common. They're well established as forest herbicides. They tend to be very low or very high on the environmentally friendly rating. So they have low environmental risks um, and they have low human risks. So glyphosate is the active ingredient in Roundup. You've also probably seen it in Glypro and Ranger and Rodeo and Accord XRT. If you live in New York, you can find glyphosate in 1,100 different chemicals mixtures. So you know, if Roundup is one. There's you know another almost 1,100 that are out there. So um, please don't send me an email and say, hey, I guys just got a a bottle of something or other and it has glyphosate, what should I do? Because what I'm going to say is read the label. The label is always the best uh, and, and authoritative place to go. Glyphosate is water soluble. If you're making a foliar treatment, the concentration is going to be in about the probably 1 to 3 percent active ingredient. That's what looks like an A1, but that's an AI active ingredient. If you're applying it to exposed wood, through a hack and squirt or through a cut stump or through a, a drill and injection procedure, you're going to be uh, have a, a much hotter mixture, 20 to 50 percent. Glyphosate is highly mobile in the tree. That's why it's uh, one of my preferred ones, particularly with the exposed wood. It's not mobile via a foliar treatment, so that doesn't work. And there's no soil activity. So if you put it on a tree or you spill it on the ground, it's going to bind with the soil organic matter. I forgot to look up the half-life of glyphosate in, in the woods, but it's something on the order of 30 to 45 days. So there's a very short half-life. Triclopyr is what's common in the Garlon products uh, and Pathfinder which is a premix. The other Gar Garlon 3, 3A, Garlon 4, Garlon 4 Ultra, I think all of those are restricted use, so you have to be a certified applicator. I believe that it's, and it should be Pathfinder 2, 
Um, so Roman numeral two, Pathfinder two is available for sale uh, in a non-restricted sense. These are typically mixed in oil, although Garlon three and three A can be mixed in water. I'm not as familiar with the Garlon products, so I'll just say you should mix them as per the label. They have been used in foliar and basil bark and on exposed wood like in um, cut stump treatments. They're not particularly mobile in the tree, and that's either good or bad depending upon what you want to accomplish. If you want to kill just the parent tree and not, uh, not have it flash out uh, to other species, to other nearby beech stems, then this might be a preferred chemical over the glyphosate. Dave is here. Great. Hi, Dave. Uh, that may be in uh, Pennsylvania. He says all Garlon products are non-restricted use. I thought in New York that the Garlon 4 was a restricted use. So we can we can check up on that. So Dave is here. Dave is the one I was mentioning who's going to be talking, giving the webinar in May, and has also done a lot of great work with herbicides. You can see Dave's website there, the extension PSU. FMV website. Okay, there's lots of commentary coming up. I can't keep up with it right now. So I'm just going to keep to, please keep the comments coming because you all can read and listen at the same time. I can't read and think and talk and uh, respond at the same time. So they will be there and uh, I'll, I'll, we'll come back and look at those comments at the end. So in the large tree dominated woods, the uh, the cut stump treatment uh, starts with cutting the tree down using directional felling, applying glyphosate to the cut surface uh, as per the label, and so that would be a, probably a, either concentrate or a dilution. Uh, you'll see I'm going to recommend something in the mid 20s as a as a concentration rate. This is fully effective on adult stems, 100%. So that means the the root the stump that you treat that stump dies and it does not sprout and it'll be uh, upwards of 90 or so percent effective on all the connected root suckers and it may very well be 100 percent effective on the root suckers it's just that there are smaller stems mixed in of seed origin that are not effective not affected um, use some caution if you're using cut stump where there are multiple size classes and you can see that here where you have a large beech tree and then you have some smaller beech trees we had single it wasn't replicated um, so i don't want to push the results the interpretation of the results too far but we did a cut stump treatment on the bigger trees we had fairly good kill on the so I say 62% of the saplings so 62% of the stems of this size were controlled but fewer than 25% of these whips were controlled and I believe that that's because glyphosate is going to be uh, moving towards the most actively growing meristem so those trees that are getting the most uh, most sun the, the terminal bud is that growing meristem and so the glyphosate that's moving from the cut stump of the big tree is being preferentially taken up by these mid-sized trees that are still standing making less of it available for these smaller stems so uh, if you're working in a woods where the, that has these mixed size classes the, the more of these smaller stems you can cut uh, probably cut and cut and treat is going to be um, to your advantage so the costs here, and this was from a few years ago where I was buying Accord, which is now Rodeo Concentrate. I was getting two and a half gallons for about $100 delivered. That concentrate is a 53.8% concentrate. Um, the control that it provided was, I'll say, about 90% control. The cost per acre was about $37 an acre, which worked out to be about $0.60 cents per square foot of beach basal area. When I diluted that glyphosate or that accord one to one in water that cut the concentration in half, I still maintained a very high level of control. Um, so 75 to 85 percent. You'll note that my cost per acre didn't was not cut in half. That's probably because I was over treating those stems. So I was putting on slightly more uh, chemical. Uh, and, and therefore I was working at a, effectively a higher dose rate but it's still it's a reduction in cost 
Garlon and Stalker, which are the triclopyr and imazapyr products, uh, were not as effective in controlling. So this control is relative to root suckers. Were not as effective in controlling the root suckers. They had a higher cost per acre and a higher cost per square foot of of uh, beach basal area. So, but again, if you're what you're trying to do is control just individual stems and you're trying to limit the spread into other species, uh, not other species, there was no transfer into other species, limit transfer into other beech trees, the garlon is a, is a reasonable product. So uh, where we're doing hack and squirt, and this is, uh, Dave has been doing a lot of work uh, with hack and squirt, um, and so I'm going to just not go into a lot of details in this. Dave can comment in the chat box or um, he will go into more details of this in May. But essentially what you're doing is um, using a hatchet and you're making a chop mark in the tree and then you're using some kind of a squirt bottle, a dispenser to apply the chemical to that exposed wood. And that's why earlier I was talking about exposed wood treatments, whether it's a cut stump or a hack and squirt, you're putting the chemical on that exposed wood. It draws the chemical into the vascular system of the tree and kills the tree. So it's gonna be um, highly effective on the on the beech trees, and neither of these trees pictured are beech trees, but the glyphosate is going to be highly effective on those trees, the parent trees, and it has uh, less reliable flash into the root system. Um, there's a published study from uh, Jeff Kokenderfer and colleagues in the Forest Service where they hack and squirt at all stems bigger than one inch, which seems like an awful lot of work to me. Uh, but then there they had pretty good control of the other stems. Um, but um, the, if, if all you're doing is the larger trees, I think there's there's more variation in how much of that uh, control is going to be applied to the suckers. Okay, um, so to wrap up this large dominated tree, and I'm talking way too slow, I've got 12 minutes left, so we're going to crank it up here. Cutting alone is not going to work. If you're a maple producer, uh, New York State DEC, because you're using a chemical in the food production area, has some potential for regulatory oversight. I have written documentation if you're a maple producer and would like to see that, where you can use glyphosate as a cut stump or as a, a hack and squirt in your sugar bush outside of the maple production season, which is probably not when you're going to want to use it anyway. Um, if you have beets that are that are appear to be healthy, so they lack evidence of the scale insects or the disease, I would say avoid nearby treatments. If you are going to use nearby treatments, use hack and squirt, or use a complete girdle, and maybe use a, a triclopyr product. Um, you can also treat frozen wood because frozen wood doesn't translocate chemicals very well in, in terms of a of a cut stump. Um, or use Garlon 4, where we had very poor trans, when the work that I did, we had very poor movement from cut stump trees uh, into suckers. The costs tend to be favorable, um, and if you're selling firewood, you can probably at least break even or maybe show a little bit of a profit uh, when you include the labor and the chemical costs doing a cut stump treatment. So we fill in this, so we're a third of the way through. Um, Looking at these larger trees, I'm saying that there are no effective methods with mechanical. There's some chatter going on in the chat box, which may suggest otherwise. Um, but by and large, the most effective ways are going to be to use chemical treatments. <laughs> now we'll look at the mid-sized. These are forest stands where there is some history of cutting of beech. The beech, I say, are going to be two to six inches in diameter. Essentially, think about no commercial or no merchantable stems, or very few merchantable stems. The key here is that they're going to be fewer than 500 beech trees per acre. Um, if you have these areas that are predominantly saplings, uh, what I'd recommend is if you can postpone the treatment, do so. Uh, the fewer stems you have, the less cost you're going to have. 
And uh, as those trees get bigger, some of them are going to die naturally just through the process of forest development. And so you can save yourself some work. You can kind of kick the can further down the road. However, you may need to control beech if you are trying to regenerate the forest. You may have an overstory of desirable species and an understory of these sapling-sized trees. Uh, you may need to control those in order to regulate the amount of light that's in the understory. So what are your options? Here you, there are some selective mechanical options. They all involve a variation of girdling. In fact, all of, the, all of these selective treatments involve um, girdling. So the stem girdling with the chainsaw, as you see here on an ash tree, flame girdling, as you see here, uh, or using a brush saw. In all cases, these are going to be most effective at controlling the abundance of beech in, in regulating the balance of other species if there's a closed canopy. So it's it's a um, you're you're reducing the the rate of response of the beech suckers through shade. Uh, this would be probably most effective working in small areas rather than you know on a 40 acre area. Uh, you have to treat every tr beech tree that you want dead. You have to treat every beech tree. Um, I'm not aware, maybe Dave or some other folks know, if when you do these kinds of individual stem treatments, whether those stems will also produce suckers. Uh, the, the selective mechanical doesn't control root suckers, per se. I mean, there's no translocation of the girdle, the effect of the girdling into the root suckers that might be originating from the root systems. They are all considered organic, um, and, and labor is the primary cost. Uh, this is some work that Ralph Nyland did where he was working with a brush saw and uh, he, so he had a timber sale that was marked. You can see the, the paint on the trees. Those are, I'm guessing those are the leaf trees. And uh, what Ralph wanted to do was reduce the abundance of beech in the understory to allow for the regeneration of sugar maple. And that happened by uh, providing a, a short duration of uh, increased sunlight, setting the beech back and allowed sugar maple seedlings to develop. The beech trees did as well, uh, but the point being that he would, that Ralph was able to redevelop or reestablish sugar maple seedlings um, and, and create balance in the stand. But again, this, this hinges upon being able to maintain a closed uh, overstory canopy as those other species develop. Remember, if, if you provide some sunlight to these uh, beech stems that have been cut with a brush saw, then you're going to end up with um, those suckers uh, growing pretty quickly. And then there are some other um, mower head options that would be broadcast mechanical. And somebody I'm not able to see it uh, shattering the stump. So some of these different machines are going to be more likely to shatter the stump than to cut and sever the stump. And that shattering is uh, is an option that may provide some longer term control of American beach. Selective chemical, this is what's called basal bark treatment. Um, or you can do hack and squirt if you have slightly larger sapling sized trees. Uh, these are going to have uh, very high kill rates on the stems that are treated. There's going to be limited control of suckers because of limited flash. Uh, and in fact, in fact, the basal bark treatments are going to have uh, no flash. The hack and squirt may have a little bit of flash. The Garlon products, triclopyr is what's used uh, for, for treatment through basal barks. And the costs on this, um, I got these numbers a few years ago. The costs were about $150 an acre for the chemicals. Labor costs are going to be relatively high. And Dave has done some work um, on uh, dilutions of the triclopyr. So if you buy the Pathfinder um, uh, 2 as a product, it comes in at 13% active ingredient. Or if you can buy, some people are saying on the chat box that you can get the Garlon 4 as a non-restricted use. Um, and you can do your own dilutions. Dave has found very good success with these lower rates. And he's going to go into the details of this in May. What I'd encourage you, he has a great fact sheet. Go to Google and, and search for basal bark herbicide PSU or um, yeah, I don't think I posted the link to that on the Ning site. 
but anyway, so check this out. There's some, some good results and very um, encouraging in terms of the costs to be able to do this in the summer with, with, with uh, much lower uh, active ingredient rates. So if we're working in the not quite firewood category, here we do have several options in the mechanical and we also have some options in the chemical. So selective basal bark and cut stump with glyphosate to the larger stems. I didn't really talk about that, but you could go in and do cut stumps. You're going to get some flash. Uh, the surface area of the stump is effectually, effectively the wick. So the bigger the wick, the bigger the flash. So you don't get very much flash from a cut stump treatment. Now, for working in areas where we have more than 500 stems per acre, and it's really it's less the size, more the number in terms of the economics, but you have um, lots of these smaller stems. Excuse me. Uh, the, the options here, uh, traditionally, the, the most effective option has been some kind of a broadcast mist blower, and you can see a person wearing a backpack sprayer doing a mist spray. This is, I think, mostly of fern picture of uh, Jerry Michael provided. Here's an, an older picture you can see by the lack of personal protective equipment, but it's essentially a skidder or a bulldozer with a, a, a mist blower attached to the back that's spraying into the canopy. Um, great, so Dave just put in his, his link to that um, uh, selective basal bark, stem selective basal bark treatments. The, this is a treatment that uses very low concentrations of active ingredient, one to two quarts in 25 gallons is one to two percent, so it's a very dilute mixture of glyphosate. Use it during the summer, during the active growing season, and this is what the understory looks like after it has been treated. So it's, it creates a very clean understory. You can see in this picture there's still a lot of saplings and small poles that are limiting the availability of sunlight to the forest floor. The smaller stems have been treated. Uh, killing the beech whips um, treatment is going to, in the broadcast treatments, you're going to have control over the entire understory. Uh, so if you have desirable stems, then they're going to be collateral damage. But typically, that collateral, there's not enough of those to warrant um, much concern. If you do have enough, uh, this is why we use integrated vegetation management to see what's out there, then you may need to consider some other options. Costs using the skitter mounted are going to be in the $150 per acre range if you have enough acres to make it justifiable. When you start getting into the um, you know, kind of localized broadcast treatments or small area broadcast treatments, the costs are probably going to go up. Okay, and just recently, um, I think before I even announced this webinar, Steve Cutney, who's the uh, chair of the Southern Finger Lakes Tier chapter of NIFOA, sent around some pictures and described his process, and I wanted to share that, where he's doing selective brush sawing. So he was working with a forester, and the forester identified that there's going to be some problems associated with too much beach. There were some existing oak seedlings, and Steve wanted more, and plans to conduct a timber harvest in the next six to ten years. So this is kind of the perfect scenario where you see a problem and you're working in advance of the timber harvest. So that's um, that speaks very highly for Steve's motivation here. He used selective cutting with a steel uh, brush saw, power saw, and then sprayed using a solo uh, number 418 uh, pressurized pump sprayer. It holds um, there's a, uh, I don't remember if it's a liter or a gallon. Steve's online, so he can chime in if he remembers if it's a liter or a gallon. Relatively, it's one liter. Um, you can buy bigger ones, but Steve's able, to, because of the size of this, is able to handle both the sprayer and the brush saw at the same time. He did about 12 acres, used a 20% concentration of glyphosate. He would cut a beech stem and then, and then hit it with the uh, herbicide mixture. So those are, uh, the picture on the left is the before picture, and then after brown up, so he's cut the stems and he's browned it out, and he has a quite a clean looking understory. Now it still looks, and I haven't confirmed with Steve, but it looks like in the background of this picture there may be some, some mature beech trees that maybe during the time of the harvest would be treated with a cut stump treatment. 
Uh, so there may be some additional follow-up. And then Steve also knows that he has to do uh, monitor the impact, potential impacts of deer in order to get the success that he wants. Goats are an option for those people that are willing to, to, to manage, uh, I'll say, broadcast mechanical. Goats will eat each. Uh, goats are basically a domestic deer. Um, there's n almost no nutritional value in beech, so if you're using livestock, you're going to have to provide them some supplemental feed. Um, and there's, I mean, we've had other webinars just on silvopasture, so I'm not going to go into those details. Uh, goats can be effective. Here they've gone and they've stripped a bunch of sapling and pole-sized trees. You can see the work they do here, and then you can see in this picture that the larger stems, if the goats are controlled for the, for regulated for a particular period of time, um, will not damage those larger trees, likely because the bark on those larger trees is heavier and thicker than it does on the smaller trees. Now, none of these trees are dead. Um, right? All of these trees are going to sprout, and they all sprout right at the base of the tree where there's still some bark left. So, um, but again, we come back to our objectives, and we think about what's the duration of control, and what are we trying to accomplish? So in some circumstances, this would be an effective amount of control. Uh, and then again, we can use those same mower heads uh, to do some kind of a broadcast mechanical. Um, I think this is, this is an area that I'm going to do some research in the summer to look at kind of the, the long-term effects. Uh, see, and, and then also look at re-sprouting using maybe a couple different kinds of, of cutter heads. Um, and I'll have more information on costs, but I'm, the costs are somewhere in the $150 to $200 per hour. Okay, so we've filled out our matrix. Um, as we move towards the smaller stems, we have an increasing num variety of treatments that we can apply, but we also have greater costs. So here, with larger trees, we have the potential to generate some revenue because we can sell and utilize the low-grade material that's being cut. But then when we get out to these smaller stems where there's the potential for either greater capital costs for that equipment um, or greater labor costs or more chemical um, or whatever, or handling time, then the costs are going to go up. So that's why if you can work with and manage the impacts where you have some large trees, you're better off. So in conclusion, uh, profile your situation to understand if you need to control the beach. If you decide that you do need to control the beach, um, identify some specific management targets in terms of the percent mortality, the duration of the control, and the spatial pattern of the control. You need to plan for the next understory. So you can't just go in and say, I'm going to kill all the beach trees uh, because something may come in. Those beach trees were utilizing resources. Something else may come in and utilize those resources. So you want to make sure you don't just uh, replace uh, one problem with another problem. Select whatever is the appropriate treatment for your particular situation. And again, what you do on one acre may be different than what you do on a different acre. If you're using pesticides, please read the label. I use just a very few pesticides, and every year, almost every time I go out, I reread the label because it's just, I think it's that important to know and understand the chemicals that you're using. Uh, there is the potential for success with organic methods. Uh, mechanical methods, they tend to be better when you're working underneath the closed canopy, canopy because you're taking advantage of the shade on the beach. And even though beach is tolerant of shade, um, it, it is responsive to sunlight. And then we have to monitor what's happening. So with that, I'm going to open the floor up to questions, and I'll just call your attention to the fact that when I, uh, when we close out of here, um, you're going to, um, there will automatically be a, um, an exit survey posted. Okay, so lots of comments, so feel free now if you have comments or questions to plug them in here. And I'm going to try to make my chat box bigger so I can see more of the questions. I don't know if that affects your screen or not, but I just made my chat box great big. And I'll scroll backwards.
Okay. Carl asked about genetic engineering. I'm not aware of that. There's been some work. I was just refreshing myself on some of the genetics of um, tolerant and resistant trees. Um, I'd say go go to the internet. I shared some links with the, the Forest Service and Dave Houston is Mr. Beach. So look in the Forest Service, just do a search for, for David Houston Beach and you'll get lots of publications. Um, or look up, you know, genetic management or genetic tolerances in American Beach. Greg asks about winter logging to minimize suckering. Uh, so well, if, if you have frozen ground, um, which doesn't always happen in the winter, but if you have frozen ground, then, then there might be less damage to the roots, but it's the, the fact that you're cutting the stems and providing sunlight, I, I, would, I, I doubt that you're going to have that much of a reduction in suckering. Now, if so, in May, let's think about that. If let's say you're cutting, not cutting the beech, you're cutting other species, I think you would still have some pretty good suckering just by the, the fact that the root systems are there, you're going to warm up the soil, and um, I would say I, I would not pursue that as a strategy to uh, control beech uh, to, to maintain balance. Okay, and Dan talks about the high stem method. We need to look more into this. I, I've heard reference that one other time. Um, we need to, we'll get some more information. I'll track that down and you know, or somebody else can. So we, and go to the Ning site, okay? If you have information on this high stuff, go to the Ning site. Let's, let's start some commentary so other people can see it. Incidentally, on that Ning site, uh, beach management is the most popular topic. You know, we've had that site up for four or five years and beach management is the top topic. Okay. Uh, and I so Dave says the Garland projects products are non-restricted use. So um, that if that's the case, that's great. I thought the Garland Four and Four Ultra were restricted use. So, but if they're not restricted use, then that frees up a lot of opportunities for doing dilutions. Um, Tom Ward talks about basal bark applications and the oil carry is more effective. I'm going to defer that to Dave. Dave is going to go into uh, stem selective treatments in his May webinar. He can comment now if he's still connected, but we'll just leave it at that. So Daniel says, uh, I'm guessing this is a high stem. Cutting the beach just below the lowest live branch or two feet above the ground, supposed to limit suckering and sprouting. Okay, good. That's good to know. Dan, do you know what size classes of beach is that applied to? Is that applied to all size classes of beach? Um, we'll see if Dan's still on. Carl has a question about Garlon 4, so we need to look up the restrictedness of the Garlon products. Right, Jerry points out that according to EPA, caffeine is 15 times more toxic uh, by um, using LD50 than is glyphosate. Uh, and some of those measurements, just um, Dave Jackson has a great publication on for use of forest herbicides or something like that. And he goes into those uh, LD50 and acute toxicity ratings for a variety of different forest herbicides. Um, Rick Tyler points out uh, an observation that uh, it's important to note that garland for an oil is volatile on a hot summer day. And so if you're treating stems in the understory and it's hot and you're treating a lot of stems, then you have an accumulation of this liquid and it volatilizes. So it means it turns, it's going to turn it from a liquid, essentially a solid, into a vapor. And that vapor is going to rise and it could uh, result in damage to non target trees and foliage in the upper canopy. So um, I, I saw what was likely an example of that once, and we had gone in and were inspecting. Dave was there and uh, some other folks were looking at a, a forest site in western PA, 
there, there was a, a basal bark treatment, and then we were trying to figure out why the canopy was showing dieback, and we were we surmised that it was probably a very high. There's a lot of stems in that volatility, and so that's another good example. If you can use a lower concentration, as Dave has demonstrated, then you may get away from. You may not have as great a likelihood of that non-target um, damage. All right, so Stephen Richardson mentions uh, Ralph Nyland promotes shattering the stump along with a high stump to reduce stump sprouts. This is usually accomplished with the mechanical harvesting mowing. It's easier on smaller stems that vibrate and split under a high-speed saw. Okay, and that's what uh, Brett Chedzoy had <coughs> done some work with Beach on his property. Brett's an extension forester here in the Finger Lakes area of New York and uh, felt that, that some of the some of the power heads on those machines, and I'm not particularly familiar with the differences between a Hydroax and a Fecon and a, these other ones, but the ones that would result in a shattered stump head versus a severed stump head would reduce suckering. So Dave gave his link to the basal bark publication. Thank you, Dave. All right, and then uh, Steve Richardson mentions an article in the Northern Journal of Applied Forestry, where and I'd forgotten about this. I'm glad that he mentioned it. Um, Northern Journal of Applied Forestry, where there was uh, there was an understory of of beech and sugar maple regeneration, maybe some other species, and the research looked at varying. Uh, concentrations with and without a surfactant. And my memory is what they found when you worked with a very low dilution of glyphosate, so like a 1% concentration of glyphosate in the absence of a surfactant, that they had about 80% control of the beech seedlings and only about 20% mortality of sugar maple. So because sugar maple, the maples in general, tend to be fairly resistant to glyphosate, it's possible to use this low um, concentration of glyphosate without a surfactant. Beech is more sensitive to glyphosate, and so you're effectively um, being able to, excuse me, overspray the, the sugar maple and control the beech, and you have essentially controlled collateral damage of the maple. All right, Dan wants to know if he can recut a stump, uh, re essentially, and then control the sprouts. So you can, you can, so we, I refer to that as a resurfacing, and um, the, the effectiveness of the control will depend upon how old the stump is uh, and how tall the stump is. So if, if the stumps were a little bit taller, maybe 10 or 12 inches, and you can cut them down as low as possible, and there's still some live wood, uh, then you will get some movement through that live wood into the root system. And when I did it, uh, I was getting something on the order about 50% control of suckers uh, compared to treatment at the time of cutting, which was on the order of 85 to 90%. All right, so here's, I'm going to copy the link. Um, that's the, the study in Maine where they looked at the, the dose rate uh, overspray on beech and beech and maple seedlings. So I just pasted that into the chat box at the very end. So Ron wants to know about the boogie woogie aphids. Huh. I don't know what a boogie woogie aphid is, but now that you say that, and I'm thinking, I remember seeing some, they're almost like clouds that hang on the sides of beech trees. I've seen those once, so I'll say that they're not as common as the insect that I'm referring to, but I can't say if those aphids, if it is what I'm thinking it is, um, kill the tree or not. So maybe there's an 
uh, entomologist online that can help us with that. So Dan says he uses the high stump on trees two inches up to eight inches. Okay, so there are some links that are provided that allow us to look for the pesticide labels. Now that I've said that, and it seems that I'm wrong, I need to double check that, and I'll, I'll post a comment uh, uh, on the Ning site. Okay, Rick talks about declining um, beach uh, associated with Phytophthora. And he wants to know if anybody else has seen that. I haven't seen that. So, Rick, that's a good question to post to the Ning site. We have uh, we have people from predominantly throughout the Northeast. We have over 400 people, so that'd be a great question to post to the Ning site. Okay, so Ron's given us the scientific name for the boogie woogie. I've never heard it called the boogie woogie aphid. That's a good one. Um. So, and Steve Richardson's talking about some work that Bill Leake did. Bill Leake is a, uh, an institution unto himself. He's a silviculturalist with the U.S. Forest Service. Um, and he's talking about doing larger patch cuts, two acres and larger in northern hardwoods to reduce the beach component. Um, is this going to be outcompeted by less shade tolerant species, even if seedlings are already established? It's important to cut all the saplings, though. So, um, I think I've seen that research. I don't, and, and maybe there's some differences between Bill did his work in New Hampshire, where I've seen that in New York, where we've done patch cuts or done shelter wood cuts, even where we've cut all the saplings, and that becomes very expensive. Um, we have not been able to control beach in those situations. So, okay, well, you all have had, this has been great commentary. Um, and I, if uh, I'll, I'll say here that if, if I was mistaken on the on the restricted use of garlon, then um, I apologize, and I'll and I'll look that up and post something right away on the Ning site. Um, but I'll tell you what, that generated a lot of good commentary. So thank you all for doing that. Thank you all for those. Um, Thank you all for those, all the, the comments that you shared with us. And again, go to that Ning site. This is a great place. There's a lot of great wisdom out there and great experience. And uh, it's a shame for you to keep it locked up inside your head. So go to the Ning site and share it. Thank you all very much. And we'll see you next month, I hope.